Dear Joseph Heller, I am a stacked 18-year-old blonde on Sunset Boulevard. I am also a writer. Eve Babbitts. <laughs> so this was the letter that Eve sent Joseph Heller, and it got him to read her book. Coupled with the famous photograph of her at 18 years old, playing chess in the nude across from a clothed Marcel Duchamp, the rest is history. But of course, that's not even half of it, man. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Better Than Food Book Reviews. I'm your host, Clifford Lee Sargent. It's a beautiful day in LA, and if you'd like to see more of LA, if you'd like an in-depth tour, I made a short video essay vlog entry of a tour of downtown Los Angeles, my neighborhood, and a place called The Last Bookstore, which is this awesome independent bookstore down here, which I highly recommend. If you want to check that out, you can get access by donating a dollar or more on Patreon following this link. Really appreciate it. Thanks a bunch. I'm going to start mapping the city by bookstores, so not only will you know where to go in Los Angeles, uh, you'll know where to find the best books. So, check it out. And hopefully, you know, the idea is to do this for a whole bunch of cities down the road. The whole world, whatever. Seems to be getting good feedback, so go check it out. Eve Babbitt is one of the most resplendent creatures ever to grace the city of angels. She is literally Jim Morrison's LA woman. The St. Teresa of the politically incorrect writhing in ecstasy. All that's missing is the post-coital cigarette right there. Her writing is seductively casual. Nothing impresses her unless she lets it. But that doesn't make her this, you know, this L.A. ice queen. Far from it. There's no other L.A. author that comes to mind who is so passionately engaged in the social affairs they're partaking in. These are her fictitious, but not that fictitious, memoirs about her friends and her relationships. The juxtaposition of emotionally scorching love affairs involving the who's who and the places to be amidst the alluringly placid, unsuspecting palm trees. Eve is cool in a way few were, fewer will be, and nobody else who comes to mind is. Her father was a violinist in Schoenberg, her godfather was Stravinsky, her mother's ambitions kind of revolved around parties involving, you know, uh, whoever was interesting, you know, the most interesting people in the neighborhood at the time. It was this perfect storm that was set in 1960s Los Angeles, and she just cultivated this temperament that did not allow itself to be penetrated unless, of course, it wanted to be. And as we'll see, it did, proving to be near insatiable in its prime. Men at parties would ask her how she writes, and she would always play it just, you know, cool as a cucumber. She'd just be like, oh, on a typewriter in the mornings when there's nothing else to do. People have recently asked her why she isn't writing, and she says, I prefer to do nothing for as long as I can stand it. I love that. I <laughs> think she's so dope. I mean, really, you know, totally understated, just, uh... I'm seething with envy over her wit, you know, her, uh, her cadence, her timing, it's just, man, she's got it. Alright, so slow days, fast company, the world, the flesh, and L.A. Published in 1974, about ten short stories in here. It's using this really clever device where each short is prefaced with this line, uh, which is uh, directed at the man that she's trying to get to read her book. With the man she's seeing at the time, who she's trying to get to read her book. Since it's impossible to get this one I'm in love with to read anything unless it's about or to him, I'm going to riddle this book with Easter egg italics, so that this time it won't take him two and a half years to read my book like it did the first one. The seduction of a non-reader is how I plan to tie up L.A. My favorite note is the one right before the story Dodger Stadium, where she has this very brief and passionate fling with the all-American sport. You won't like this piece because you don't like baseball, so you can just skip it. Besides, this man means nothing to me. Hardly. Could you have a bolder introduction? She appreciated masculinity and femininity, and knew that discretion, punctuated with perfectly timed, sharp notes of near-obscene excess, was the key to a fulfilling life. In this day and age of men and women ducking for cover until whatever results from radical feminism and the general gory corruption riddling the country from stem to stern, I fell right smack in love with an obvious American man. And she wrote this in 1974. 
Does it feel like every generation like suddenly looks down at their genitals and then compares them with, you know, those of the object of desire and then just becomes really angry? Just like their parents who discovered theirs acted the same way and then lost out on a lot of great sex because of it and then long ago just stopped caring? She studied men and women and relationships and her friends and the city and the drugs and the parties and the fears of missing out and all the traps. She willingly went into them as a cultural researcher, as a willing participant in the cult and mythos of celluloid glamour. She was very serious, and at the same time, not serious at all. But you should take her seriously. Life was a giant party, and everyone invited was very interesting to Eve, and she was very interesting to them, and she remains so to us. That being said, she was perfectly capable of being alone. One of my favorite lines from the story is Sirocco. Being places alone makes you think. Being there with someone makes you hounded by details, like what time the other person wants to leave. Details that drain energy when you're trying to discover the core of an event. Eve practiced and wrote about the art of sex. Her novels don't contain anything even close to pornographic. I don't think there's even a sex scene. In here, it's not like you know, it's not uh, like Henry Miller or Anna Yus Nin. The aftertaste of Eve's eroticism is tragic. It's sometimes lonely, just as much as it's sarcastic or playful. It's more internal than external. It's what she's not telling you. It sounds exhausting and exhilarating to be a woman as attractive as Eve Babbitt's chasing and getting chased all over Sunset Boulevard in 1960s LA. Eve was an artistic pragmatist. She knew what she had and she did not waste it. The funny thing was I'd always believed sex masterpieces were always the best kind. Better than Bach, The Empire State Building, or Marcel Proust. I believe that most people put 98% of their creative energy into trying to stage marvelous love scenes. I believe that adultery is an art form. In France, they more or less lay their cards on the table, and ennoble love affairs for the creative adventures they are, because for most people, these are the only creative adventures they'll ever have, the only chance they'll ever get to touch the face of heaven. A writer named Stephanie Lacava wrote a review of this for the Paris Review, and she was actually outlining similarities between Eve Babbitt's and Clarice Lispector, which I found very interesting, and I suggest you check out that article. Much as I'd love to say I'm cool and I just found this on my own, I stalked the Instagram of Brett Easton Ellis, and as soon as I came across this cover, I was just like, oh, oh yeah. I urge you to listen to Brett's podcast immediately. It's fantastic. And here's the historical connection. Babbitt's was one of the first to champion the debut novel of Ellis, Less Than Zero, which Babbitt's called the novel your mother warned you about. Jim Morrison would be proud. And Eve would certainly know. Among her lovers, she had Harrison Ford, Steve Martin, and yes, the late and great Jim Morrison from The Doors. Also, funny enough, she couldn't stand his voice, and she couldn't stand the name The Doors. She thought it was totally hippie, because he took it from uh, The Doors of Perception by Aldous Huxley. I think that's hysterical. So, like Ellis and his podcast, which is all about film, I'm a frequent traveler back to the 60s and 70s, back to an era when film was dangerous and culturally important. This is an era of glorious cinema, and it's the era of Eve Babbitt's. Present day Los Angeles is haunted by the era that she writes about, and now that I think about it, I believe that is actually a word she employs to describe the desired effect a woman wants to have on a man. She wants to haunt him. Living in Los Angeles, you are very aware of your time, and you're often forced to watch yourself lose it, whether you're sitting in traffic or, you know, all of the seasons kind of just blend into this one monolithic, what, what can seem like a one long endless summer. You can lose ten years that way. It's generally expected that you're going to be late to the meeting. I find it helps to bring a book. So does she. There are a lot of people who don't grow limp with hatred when they're kept waiting. I know a whole bunch of people who don't consider the concept of 15 minutes time at all. So if they say they'll meet you at 11, and they show up at 11.25, they apologize, if they remember, for being 10 minutes late. The other 15 minutes never existed, and there's some sort of common understanding among most people that those 15 minutes are a grace period. Since I've started carrying a book everywhere, even to something like the Academy Awards, I've had a much easier time of it and the bitterness that shortens your life has been headed off at the pass by the wonderful paperback. Light, fitting easily into most purses, the humble paperback has saved a lot of relationships for me, 
that would have ended in bloodshed. Most things are tolerable here, and you're able to sort of carve your life out of a few choice locations in the city. You choose the kind of car you drive, and you're isolated as you drift through the 88 different cities that make up this huge entity. If the person you're seeing lives in Santa Monica and you live in downtown, you are effectively in a long-distance relationship. Add to this walking onto film, television, commercial sets by accident every morning, people dying around you left and right, seeing the worst states of drug addiction, and seeing some of the most beautiful people not only Southern California but the world has to offer juxtaposed right next to this, and yeah, buddy, you are in la-la land, and there's nowhere else like it. Whatever your preconceived idea of the city was, it's already wrong. You don't get a full picture of Los Angeles at any given point in time. No one does. No one can. It's impossible. It changes too quickly. Every film set in LA simultaneously got it right and wrong. It's not Beverly Hills. It's not Compton. It's not Santa Monica. It's definitely, sure as fuck, not Hollywood. LA is impossible to summarize. It's a cultural chameleon. Shift your focus, and then everything changes color. Move left or right and you'll see something different, or what you noticed before will disappear, but you'll know in the back of your mind it's still there. Check out the excellent film Los Angeles Plays Itself. It's a city where all the cool stuff happens behind closed doors, and that's something I deeply love about it. It's a secret city, it's an invisible city, and it can change your life for the best or worst. Often both. Maybe in the same day. I did not become famous, but I got near enough to smell the stench of success. It smelled like burnt cloth and rancid gardenias, and I realized that the truly awful thing about success is that it's held up all those years as the thing that would make everything all right. And the only thing that makes things even slightly bearable is a friend who knows what you're talking about. When I discovered her, and when I discovered that she's still alive, you know, I wanted to read about sort of a happy ending. For Eve, but, you know, that's not the truth. For someone who was so admirably in control of the lifestyle that allowed her to lose control, and not only lived through it, but also recovered from it and conquered it, one accident changed everything. One minute she was smoking a cigar, the next she's up in flames. Half her body was burnt and she was given a 50% chance of living. She had no health insurance at the time. This was in 97. Thankfully, a benefit at the Chateau Marmont took care of that, and she recovered, and has not written a book since. Eve is the opposite of the victim mentality. She is perseverance manifested. She's outlived most of them. She's still here. She is, in so many ways, a survivor. Eve Babbitt's is better than food. Please go check out this article in Vanity Fair by Lily Analik. It provided several great anecdotes for this review. I highly recommend it. And I would like to share the end of it because it relates to this accident. This reporter asks Eve, who's still in the hospital, uh, to tell her how this group of guys had really come through for her. You know, Harrison Ford and Steve Martin coughing up $50,000 a piece for her medical bills. A prostrate Eve, in full Camille mode, raised her head. Through cracked lips, she croaked out the words, blowjobs, before collapsing back onto the pillow. Eve was not a genius because of her love affairs and the people she knew. She knew these people, and they loved her because she was a genius. I'm from the Pacific Northwest, where rain is often seen as an oppression by someone who's grown up through it. For Eve, it's the exact opposite. The rain means freedom. The rain is freedom. It has always been like that in L.A., it's freedom from smog and unbroken, dreary, hateful sameness. It's freedom to look out the window and think of London and little violets and Paris and cobblestones. Freedom was always on Eve's mind, but the traps were just too good to pass up. But her idea of freedom remains pure because of her indulgence in the traps. Always remember that life is too short to read bullshit. If you donate $8 or more to the channel on Patreon using this link right here, you can get access to this private vlog wherein I give you a tour of Los Angeles through its bookstores. So if you've never been, you can come and you'll know exactly where to go. Today, Los Angeles, tomorrow, the world. Subscribe and always remember that life is too short to read bullshit. Hope you guys are all doing very well out there. Thanks so much for watching. Take care and have a good weekend. I'll talk to you guys soon. Ciao.